My name is Charles Burton. I'm a neurosurgeon and I'm a specialist in spine care. I've worked in this area over the past 25 years. Since 1981, I have been medical director of the Institute for Low Back Care located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The Institute for Low Back Care is an organization that specializes in the rehabilitation of complex back problems. Adhesive arachnoiditis is a complex spine challenge. It is an international ethical and medical challenge. This is an example of adhesive arachnoiditis as shown on an oil myelogram. The characteristic pattern and irregularity can also be seen on other studies such as this enhanced CT scan. The arrow shows residual droplets of oil this is an MRI scan showing the severe changes of the cauda equina produced by this oil substance. In this animation, we will explore the normal anatomy of the spinal column, the process of myelography, and the introduction of a foreign body substance into the subarachnoid space. Shown here, are the various components of the spinal column. We will focus on the lumbar area. Basically, the vertebrae are separated by tough collagenous washers called discs. On the left-hand side are the facet joints, and the vertebral processes are shown. This sagittal view allows us to appreciate the spinal canal filled with nerve roots called the cauda equina. The cauda equina represents the continuation of the nerves of the spinal cord, which actually ends at approximately the L1, L2 area. We are now looking at an enlarged segment of the spinal canal with the various membranes covering and surrounding the spinal nerves. On the outside is the thickest membrane called the dura mater. Next to it is a thinner membrane called the arachnoid membrane. The pia mater is a very fine membrane surrounding each nerve, and one sees the nerves themselves. The subarachnoid space normally contains spinal fluid. Extending from the arachnoid membrane are fine filamentous threads called trabeculi. These cross from the arachnoid to the peel membrane. The spinal fluid is produced through the arachnoid membrane, circulates around the spinal nerves, the spinal cord, and then to the brain where it is absorbed. The finest membrane is the pia. The next finest membrane is the arachnoid, shown here in close-up. It consists of a mesh of interwoven collagen fibrils, much like tissue paper would appear under a microscope. We're now going to see the introduction of a myelographic agent through a needle placed in the lumbar spine for the purposes of myelography. This is called a lumbar puncture. The needle is placed between the vertebrae, puncturing the dura and the arachnoid membrane, and the foreign substance is then injected into the subarachnoid space. Shown here is a material which is a oil 
contrast agent. This is hyperbaric. It has greater density than spinal fluid and moves downward depending on how the patient is positioned. The myelogram is therefore performed by tilting the patient up and tilting the patient down and taking fluoroscopic or x-ray pictures of this process. In this case, the dye is moving into the thoracic area. One can extend the dye into the cervical area. Sometimes dye escapes into the basilar cisterns of the subarachnoid space around the base of the brain. This is a close-up of the needle in place through the dura and arachnoid. The spinal fluid has been replaced by the contrast media, which in this case is an oil contrast media. Shown here is the filling of the interstices of this arachnoid membrane by the foreign body substance, the oil myelographic agent. The presence of this foreign body begins to initiate a secondary response, which is a normal inflammatory response to a foreign body. Following oil myelography, typically, attempts are made to remove the substance. But even after what is referred to as a successful dye removal, there is significant residual dye material trapped in the interstices of the subarachnoid space. These micro portions of dye are present in all patients. There can be microglobules and there can be residual micro columns of dye. But typically there is at least significant dye microscopically left in the subarachnoid space. The reaction or influence of the dye promotes a secondary response. This is an inflammatory response. Initially composed of white blood cells, leukocytes, mesenchymal cells, and macrophages. These are the cells that ingest or attempt to ingest foreign bodies. As the cellular response progresses, the mesenchymal cells transform themselves into fibroblasts. These are the cells that form collagen and form scar tissue. Scar tissue is, in fact, collagen. The first stage of the inflammatory process causes the spinal nerves to become enlarged and swollen, as shown here. In addition to the swelling of the nerves, there is distension of the adjacent blood vessels which become hyperemic. As the nerves swell, the subarachnoid space actually disappears. And very typically, the spinal fluid is squeezed out from in between the spinal nerves. The limitation of this is the dural sac itself. As time progresses, the second stage begins, and this is of nerve atrophy. Scarring begins to increase, and the production of collagen fibrils by the fibroblasts produces scar tissue which causes the nerves to adhere not only to each other, but directly to the arachnoid and to the dura. This animation 
shows the progression of this atrophy with production of less hyperemia with diminishing size of the distended local blood vessels and increasing amounts of scar tissue. You will note the scar tissue tends to envelop not only the nerve roots but any foreign body droplets that are attached and held in place. As the scar tissue continues to be deposited, the nerves become more adherent to each other and you will notice that they almost become part of the wall of the fecal sac. The fecal sac refers to the various layers of the dura and the arachnoid. The progression of scar tissue can be such that if one enters this dural cavity, one cannot recognize normal nerves. A lumbar puncture in a case like this can actually sever a spinal nerve because it is held fixed and can, cannot float away from the needle once it is placed. Various patterns of scar tissue can be formed. These can be appreciated on imaging studies, particularly MRI. Next illustrated is the mechanism of severe and constant pain in clinically significant cases of adhesive arachnoiditis. Normally, pain impulses travel to the brain by way of the dorsal root ganglia of the spinal nerve. No susceptive impulses pass from the dorsal root ganglion up the spinal pathways to the brain itself where pain is appreciated. When a normal dorsal root ganglia is stimulated, as shown here in a laboratory setting where a pig hair is being used, the stimulation of a normal dorsal root ganglion results in a short, quick pain impulse, which is self-limited. The situation is very different if the inflamed dorsal root ganglion is stimulated in a similar manner. There is not a short self-limited impulse, but continued long nociception constantly being produced by the dorsal root ganglion to the brain. Inflamed dorsal root ganglia are so hypersensitive that even body movements, such as breathing, can elicit a continuing train of impulses to the brain. We will now observe actual operative photographs of the various stages of adhesive arachnoiditis. The view of the first stage shows the nerves to be swollen, obliterating the spinal fluid within the dural sac. The second stage shows progression of scar with the nerves adherent to each other and to the dura. And the third phase shows such severe scarring that opening up the dura appears to be an empty cavity because of the extensive scarring. If the scar tissue begins to calcify, it can produce a condition shown here, calcific arachnoiditis, 
which can produce progressive squeezing of the nerves leading to impairment of bowel or bladder function. Although adhesive arachnoiditis can be produced by exposure to different toxic agents, there is no question but that over the past 50 years throughout the world, the primary cause of clinically significant adhesive arachnoiditis has been the presence of iophendolite in the subarachnoid space as a means of diagnostic myelography. Any invasive myelogram is capable of producing serious complications of some sort. Iophendolate, however, has been unique in this regard over the years. The disease produced adhesive arachnoiditis can be a very cruel disease. This has been and continues to be a worldwide problem. This entity has been a difficult process to understand. Thank you.